So for our interview segment, I am very delighted to welcome into our studio here in uh, Brazil with us uh, the great investigative journalist, Lee Fong. He was on our show a couple of weeks ago talking about one of the blockbuster stories that he did on the Twitter files. He has spent his career talking exactly about these issues. He has kind of made his way starting off in progressive media outlets. He's now at The Intercept, but he is somebody who has always risen above ideological and partisan politics. He's, for me, even though he's still kind of youngish, um, a very old school investigative journalist. He is the perfect guest to talk about this, all of this, and the implications of it. And we're about to do that in just a minute. So we will be right back. So I am really delighted to welcome into our studio my longtime colleague, my friend, and someone who is really a credit to American journalism, and there aren't many people about whom I say that, uh, Lee Fung. Lee, it's great to see you. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for being for, for having me, and it's great to be here. Yeah, it is great uh, for you to be here, I agree, as well, especially tonight, given that we have something that is perfectly within the intersection, if I can use that word, of the reporting that you've been doing for years, which is the way in which money buys influence across the political spectrum. So why don't we just begin with your reaction to this new indictment and some of the revelations it contains? Well, in some ways, this indictment is extraordinary. You know, you have this uh, very young billionaire who took um, money from uh, his customers and really spread it across the political system. If you look at the size and scale of this alleged fraud, um, it's extraordinary, it's unprecedented. Um, you know, obviously uh, using straw donations, uh, if that's true, that's, that's illegal. Um, and at the same time, it's also kind of benign and ordinary. Um, what Sam Bankman-Fried is accused of is what every major industry does, um, this attempt to buy influence on both sides of the aisle. And when it comes to um, Democrats to progressives to institutions where cultural liberalism uh, is dominant in the media or at universities, um, using these kind of uh, signals around um, you know social justice language, around cultural liberalism, around identity politics. That's a great way to conceal um, influence peddling to make it seem to provide like a veneer of uh, righteousness to buying off influence and influencing the process. And that's what Sam Bankman-Fried was doing. But again, that's what the airlines do, the banks. That's what the regular tech uh, industry does. Uh, it's, it's how Washington basically works. One of the things that I think angered the political establishment most about Donald Trump's political campaign in 2016 was, I don't know if you remember this specific moment, but in one of the debates, he basically stood up and said, all of Washington is a scam. When I was on the other side of the process as just kind of a billionaire, as um, somebody who was in the private sector, all I had to do was just write a check to any politician in either party. And with some exceptions, but not many, they would call me up and they would say, sir, what is it that I can do for you? And whatever he needed them to do, they would do it in exchange for that check that he was willing to offer. He was famously a guest at Bill and Hillary Clinton's wedding that showed how ensconced he was in this political culture. Having been somebody who has looked for so long at the way in which both parties operate under the scheme that you just described, how have you come to see the fights between the two parties that we're supposed to believe are so intractable and so fundamental? Do you see that more as theater and these parties serving kind of the same masters? Or do you see the fights between these two parties as being often very genuine? I think on the big picture issues on taxes, who pays and who doesn't, on regulation of businesses, of, of how basically the economy is run, um, there is broad bipartisan consensus. And there's an effort to use the emotionally evocative culture war issues as a way to distract people, to divide people, to kind of um, harness the polarization in society to keep the status quo for major corporations and special interests. And we see this playing out in so many ways in Washington. You know, um, there was an, an effort in the last Congress to crack down on the power of big tech. This is something that um, a lot of politicians have talked about. I think we all recognize the power of Facebook, 
of Amazon, of, of Google, and, and the other tech giants. And you, you look at this kind of simultaneous um, uh, exploitation of the culture war uh, when there was a, a legislative effort to kind of crack down on the way that Google and Facebook share advertising revenue with newspapers and media companies. What the Silicon Valley giants did is, is they took um, money, they gave it to front groups, and they ran ads in targeted districts that exploited the culture war without talking about the actual underlying bill. For Democratic districts, they ran ads that said that if we uh, pass this legislation, uh, we will have uh, more hate speech and more hate groups on the internet. Don't, don't allow your legislator to support hate speech and, and other neo-Nazi groups because you know, sharing ad tech re revenue will mean more Breitbarts or whatever. And on the right, they said, okay, look, this is an effort to actually censor conservatives and you know, this is a way for Washington liberals to kind of crush you under their thumb like they always do. It's like, okay, well, this is a way no one's actually talking about the underlying bill. This is a way that, that this is a way to get people angry and upset about legislation they probably don't understand. You know, I think about this issue a lot um, because you don't, on the one hand, want to completely dismiss the importance of what is this umbrella group of culture war issues. They 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 do matter to people. People feel strongly about whether abortion should be legal or criminalized. People sure. feel strongly about whether same-sex marriages ought to be recognized under the law or not. They feel strongly about whether children should have access to puberty blocking medication and even surgeries in order to change their gender and you go down the list if you want to even group in things like gun control and crime policy. Sometimes those get grouped into culture war issues as well, though I think they're kind of outside of it. So on the one hand, these issues are not trivial and unimportant. People feel strongly about them. They can affect people's lives. On the other hand, the more we are at each other's throats about those issues, the more we're focused incessantly on what a lot of times are easier political fights to have, right? Like it's easier to fight with your neighbor about what books a school is going to include in their curriculum than it is to say, deconstruct the hegemony of Goldman Sachs and the CIA. So it's tempting to do that because the results are more immediate. The more we're doing that though, the happier power centers are because the more we're fighting with one another, the less we're focused on them. How do you think, and I realize you tend to look at these things as a journalist, but having presented that problem that you just described, what is the way to kind of get people to find that right balance? I mean, that's a tough question. I, I think that if you, if you look at any of these issues and how people talk about them, whether there's a, the, that's these you know, nonprofit think tanks, um, the, the different media outlets, what have you, there just isn't a lot of understanding of the other side and an attempt to genuinely engage on the issues. But there is this kind of overarching effort to exploit, to flatten um, actual points of difference and cynically exploit them to make us hate each other. Like for another example on the um, big tech um, crackdown, you know, Amazon has faced these criticism, criticism around uh, counterfeit goods on their platform um, as they faced legislation in the last year to kind of crack down on that they paid a number of Asian, African American, and Latino groups that went, out, went and lobbied on their behalf and said that, look, if you require more photo identification and you know, user verification for resellers on online platforms, well, that sounds a lot like voter ID, therefore it's racist. You know, that's a way to flatten the debate, not to actually talk about the, the, the nuanced policy issues. That's a, an emotional shortcut to get people angry to then join Amazon and be their de facto lobbyists because they've been recruited into the, the culture war. You know, this has been going on for a long time. I remember the first example I ever recall of it. Um, you know, I started writing about politics in late 2005, and this is right around the time we were obviously already in Iraq, you know, with the major military force of a couple hundred thousand troops and neocons were very eager to go change the government next in, in Iran. And there was that quote, anonymously it probably came from Richard Pearl or Paul Wolfowitz, maybe even David Frum, that was leaked that said, real men go to Baghdad, uh, to, to Tehran. Like Baghdad is, is not enough, we want to go to Iran. And out of nowhere, there started to appear all of these stories about the abuse and mistreatment of gay men by the Iranian government about gay men hanging from cranes and the sure. like and all these kind of cons neoconservatives who didn't evince the slightest interest ever in any LGBT issues, much less the plight of Iranian gay men, suddenly started exploiting 
these kind of social justice causes to gin up hatred among Democrats toward the Iranian regime by saying, look at how they oppress gay men. This has now become a major way that the West supports and sustains support for imperialism and militarism, even it's done in Ukraine. Oh, Ukraine, you know, loves uh, LGBT people and look at this like trans soldier in the Ukrainian army, but Putin and the Russians hate gay men. It's used in Israel and Palestine. If you go to Israel, they'll take you to all the nice gay clubs in Tel Aviv and they'll tell you that Hamas hangs gay men in order to get you to be more on the side of Israel. You have focused on the use of those kind of tactics in the domestic context when it comes to economic policy. Let's put one of the articles that we I want to ask you about from Lee up on the screen um, from The Intercept. Do we have that? Let's put that article up there. Um, it's from uh, 2022, the headline is Lobbyists Mingle with Congress Under the Banner of Celebrating Diversity. And the subheadline is Corporate Lobbyists are Sponsoring Events, Celebrating Racial Progress to Advocate for Their Clients' Business Interests. These are corporate lobbyists who are, you know, on K Street, whose job it is to generate profit, and they're using this kind of agenda of racial progress as post George Floyd, post George Floyd, to promote their corporatist agenda. Talk about that specific example and how what that shows about how this works. Yeah, this is the this is how money flows into the Democratic side in Congress. Um, you know, it, it would be untoward to kind of have uh, a welcome event for Congress that has an official banner that says Exxon Mobil and Weiss Management and you know Goldman Sachs. Uh, that would. Uh, be obviously problematic for a lot of uh, left-leaning lawmakers or lawmakers that campaigned on social change. Um, but all you have to do to conceal that, um, you know, uh, kind of nasty image, but still have the same effect of lobbyists cozying up and partying uh, with legislative staff and lawmakers and gaining influence, the kind of day-to-day -day transaction uh, based economy of Capitol Hill, is to use a diversity event. The Tri Caucus, the Asian American, Hispanic, and Black uh, congressional caucuses have their own affiliate nonprofits that are almost 100% corporate funded. Their boards are dominated by corporate lobbyists. When they make big decisions on who to uh, endorse, often that's actually done by the corporate lobbyists that fund those um, congressional caucus nonprofits. And in just this new Congress that was recently gaveled in, you have parties almost every week celebrating, um, you know, Lunar New Year for Asian Americans. And there's a in, in this article we mentioned a number of Hispanic and Latino uh, caucus events. Um, and again, these are uh, lobbyists organized, you know, just absolute swamp activities. Where if, if you, we looked at the pictures uh, posted on social media from these events. And you zoom in, and it's one congressional staffer for Hakeem Jeffries next to a pharmaceutical lobbyist, next to another uh, lawmaker, next to another bank lobbyist. It's just the same kind of cesspool, but under this banner of promoting diversity and inclusion. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I mean, in a way, I think you're the perfect guest for this new indictment because one of the things the indictment reveals is just how cynical Sam Bankman Fried and his political guru, Sean McAuley, became about let's just associate yourself with these woke causes and that will immunize you not only from regulatory scrutiny but also from negative media attention. This is something you've been spending a lot of time on, which is why I say he didn't invent it. He just kind of detected it and they used it. There's another uh, example. And by the way, since we went over a little time and I want to continue to explore this with Lee while we have him. Um, we also are now streaming on Locals, which will be as our after show as well. Um, let's put this other article uh, that is similar in theme to the one that you uncovered. Um, can we put that up there? There is the article from 2022, The Evolution of Union Busting, and it's entitled Breaking Unions with the Language of Diversity and Social Justice. So obviously there has been a long Supporting unions has been, and unionizing and organizing unions has been a long time cause of the left. And yet I've noticed all the time now that when corporations want to persuade their workers to reject unionization and the organization of unions, they of course don't say, oh, you're going to eat into our bottom line. That's not the kind of rhetoric that appeals to people. They instead in court, in, 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 in smuggle in this kind of social justice language as a way of sabotaging union drives. Talk about some of the things that, that you've uncovered as part of that reporting. Yeah, this was a, a fun story report. I attended a number of conferences 
uh, that are sponsored by the union suppression industry. Um, this is a $300 million a year industry where you know, major corporations hire special consultants that go into a, a company that's facing a union threat and they hold captive meeting seminars with employees to dissuade them because you know, there's typically a vote to decide if, if workers can join a union or not. And you know, this has gone on for a very long time. It's a very sophisticated industry. And you know, back in the day, they used threats of violence. There was you know, um, weapons used and intimidation on the picket line, um, kind of threats to offshore jobs in the 70s and 80s, which were often um, you know, actuated. But like, in the last decade, we've seen a very uh, sharp turn where a lot of workers in more left-leaning industries, the tech industry, Starbucks, uh, REI, you know, co companies that kind of uh, uh, have, have a large number of, of liberal Democrat employees, they're facing a growing movement to unionize, to, to join the labor movement. And you see these union avoidance consultants rebranding. They're becoming diversity consultants, DEI consultants. And they're going in and saying, look, you don't need to join a union to have your voice at the company. We can just talk about issues around identity. It's a very intimate way to kind of connect to, a, to an employee. And they, and they give alternatives. They say, instead of joining a labor union, uh, we'll create an employee resource group. This is a special club or association of gay or Asian or what, what have you employees. And you, you know, you'll have a pizza party once a month. And we'll have a, a hotline if you have any issues. But just don't join a labor union because that would actually, you know, they don't say this part, but that would actually cost the company money. I mean, at the end of the day, whether it's lobbying Congress, what we just talked about, or this kind of union busting, they want to take away decisions that change the kind of power structure where more power will be redistribu redistributed to workers, to um, common people, and they want to keep those decisions in, in the hands of investors and management. And this is the, the same thing, where um, the attempts to crush this growing labor movement we've seen in the last few years are adopting the language, uh, the kind of symbols and rhetoric of, of social justice activists and explicitly using these, these demands for diversity and inclusion as kind of a jujitsu to undermine uh, this this effort at unionization. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's so it's so incredibly cynical and yet so remarkably effective because anything that has that kind of woke branding is assumed reflexively at this point to be something appealing and attractive and just. Um, speaking of which, I you know I I think I started really noticing a kind of sea change where uh, these sorts of things are concerned maybe 10 or 15 years ago when it came to Al Sharpton because a lot of people don't remember when Al Sharpton ran for president in I believe it was 2004 he was he kind of occupied the Jesse Jackson lane um, obviously the comparison of them both being African-American candidates but it went beyond that which was it was very ideological they were running as left-wing critics of the Democratic Party Jesse Jackson was a very harsh critic of the Democratic Party and actually had a pretty successful 1998, 1988, I believe, primary run where he won multiple uh, primaries, multiple states with this message that the Democratic Party was abandoning its working class roots, was becoming the party of corporations. And Al Sharpton kind of took up that mantle and in 2004 was attacking John Kerry and John Edwards and that kind of wing of the Democratic Party saying that they're too much in bed with corporations and with lobbyists and the like, doing the same thing on, on war as well. And then suddenly I started noticing that a lot of times Al Sharpton would start to appear and give his support for exactly the kind of corporatist bills and uh, other legislative initiatives that he would typically have denounced for years from the left. And there was clearly a flow of money going from a lot of these corporations into his activist groups. What is your journalism revealed about Al Sharpton and the kind of, to me, he seems like a pioneer in this circle. And he has often talked about um, this in racial terms before, saying, why shouldn't we as influential black people also get the same kind of lobbyist funding that influential white lobbyists get as well? What is that kind of signal to you? Well, this, I mean, he kind of represents this kind of schism in the Democratic Party that, you know, from the New Deal through the Great Society, you had this kind of very materialist grounded uh, focus of the Democratic Party that you know advanced civil rights at the same time of advancing universal economic policy of increasing the social safety net of, of cracking down on corporate power of making sure workers are have a seat at the table 
And there was kind of a, a break in, in the 60s where you had this movement towards um, neoliberal identity politics. Um, a lot of kind of activists, entrepreneurs um, embraced this rhetoric and ideology of you know, um, black capitalism that kind of, uh, that, that Sharpton now represents. And, uh, you know, he has this... That inured very much to his benefit, for sure, from like an MSNBC contract sure. to all sorts of other ways. I mean, even that MSNBC contract is fascinating. You know, when MSNBC uh, was purchased by Comcast, there was an incredible lobbying effort because the DOJ uh, and other regulatory authorities were, were looking at this from an antitrust perspective. This is a major, um, you know, uh, uh, concentration of economic power. And uh, Al Sharpton led the effort uh, to lobby legislators saying, look, Comcast and MSNBC are, are devoted to diversity and, and inclusion. And look, they're going to give these set-asides for uh, you know, non-white, um, black, or Asian, or whatever um, uh, content on, on their cable shows. Um, and it, it, it certainly worked. It was approved. I mean, and then that, he got a show. That, you know, so. thing, isn't it, that, that is really amazing. I mean, like, it's just such an open. First of all, the idea that Al Sharpton, the Al Sharpton of the 80s, 90s, and the early aughts, would go to bat for a major corporation like Comcast and lobby the Justice Department against enforcing antitrust laws by, you know, what wasn't really called woke ideology then, but by appealing to those kinds of social justice. Uh, symbols is amazing in and of itself. Like this should be a gigantic red flag. But that was a case where he really got paid by Comcast when he was hired for what was a very poorly reviewed show. He was terrible on camera. He could barely read a teleprompter. Nobody watched that program. The contract was multi millions of dollars. When they finally got rid of him off prime time, they put him on the weekend where he's still getting paid. It was such an overt quid pro quo, but it was done with Al Sharpton you know, invoking these kind of left-wing causes for what was clearly a corporatist agenda. Go on YouTube and the National Action Network, Sharpton's organization, has an annual conference and watch their proceedings. It's um, every big wig of the Democratic Party, Pete Buttigieg, Obama, Hillary, what have you, going and, you know, singing his praises and, and talking at the conference. And then each event is interspersed with corporate lobbyists coming up and thanking the National Ac Action Network for what they're doing and pledging their, their money to his group. And what you don't see during the conference is how the National Action Network and Al Sharpton then go and mobilize civil rights groups and, you know, he has his own network. Uh, for their regulatory tax and other corporate issues on Capitol Hill. I mean, last year, uh, Al Sharpton was calling legislators, asking them to drop the provision of the Biden legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, that had to do with the carried interest loophole that would have taxed um, hedge fund managers and private equity bosses uh, to make sure that they paid a fair rate in taxes. Right now, they can pay capital gains less than their own secretaries and janitors. Mm -hmm. um, what, what he's done the last year, he's, he's paid by Reynolds America, the big tobacco company, and he's, mo he, he's now working with uh, George Floyd's family and, and bringing them to press conferences, saying that the FDA's effort to crack down on menthol cigarettes is racist. Um, this is what he does. I mean, this is this is just kind of. I mean, this. Yeah, this you is, pay Al Sharpton, <laughs> and he shows up to say that whatever legislation you're against or whatever regulation you want to board off is itself racist, and it's it's a business. It's a racket. It's a business that all of DC operates around, <laughs> and you know, in particular, it, it works in, in like there are different ways to influence Republican conservative audiences based on their values. I mean, you know, corporations, the same corporation will fund Al Sharpton and a number of LGBT causes, and and meanwhile, to influence Republicans, they'll fund like Newt Gingrich, uh, or Newt Gingrich, and you know, more jingoistic kind of uh, religious organizations that have appeal and cachet with Republican audiences. It's it's a dual strategy that again exploits the polarization in America. But if you live in, you know, it's particularly effective for the media and for universities where these ideas are dominant and in states that have a lot of power. You know, where I'm based in California and in states like New York, it's essentially a one-party state. In California, there's a super majority of Democrats in the legislature, a Democratic governor. You know, Biden wins by huge majorities there. Um, but it's a state that's still incredibly uh, unequal. It's a state where corporations win most of the major policy battles. And again, it's using the same kind of strategy that Sharpton, I don't know if he pioneered, but he's certainly a very effective at, at deploying, of um, taking uh, social justice, justice rhetoric and deploying it to 
basically manipulate voters into agreeing with the corporate bottom line. We, we've seen this with um, uh, Prop 22, Prop 15, with efforts to reduce the, the cost of pharmaceuticals. Um, they pay off lots of different identity groups, and they accuse their opponents of being bigoted, and they uh, eventually manipulate voters into agreeing with them, because we have this kind of proposition system to change the state constitution every two years. Yeah, you, you basically can't get anything done in Democratic Party or left liberal circles as your colleague Ryan Graham has done a good job of reporting as well, that within these progressive organizations, they basically implode on each other because of this without accusing the people you're trying to defeat in some way of supporting bigotry or, or white, supremacy, right, white supremacy. So even when it comes to just like the most financially oriented corporatist policies that are designed to protect the wealthy, somehow they end up having, you know, sort of like the Al Sharptons of that state, people who purport to be professionalized activists on behalf of some ethnic group or racial group, going to bat for these corporations, claiming that whatever legislative or regulatory proposal is pendant to restrict their power is in some way racist or, or white supremacist. It's amazing to watch. I want to share one quick anecdote because uh, this is maybe personal to you. We've talked a little bit about the captains of industry, big tech and banking and whatnot. But this, this, just, this is how legislation is done in California. Um, I went to Sacramento a few years ago and there was an effort to regulate um, uh, uh, minks, uh, mink farming, uh, you know, fur coats, uh -huh. and uh, you know, the mink farming industry is incredibly cruel. These are territorial animals, so when you put them in crates right next to each other and they can kind of sense each other nearby, they go insane. They start like chewing off their own paws. Um, so this, when the when the, the California legislators sought to uh, regulate this industry, um, the fur coat industry. Uh, paid off, and we, ha we got the text messages, they were offering them $100 gift, gift certificates or cash or whatever to a, a number of students who were bused to Sacramento and told to testify against this legislation. They did not say they were with the fur industry, that they were paid by the fur industry. Um, they went and said, you know, they brought young African American men to say, you know, fur coats are part of our, our culture, culture and, you know, they show a level of social economic status and doing this and cracking down on fur coats is racist. Right. And they, they brought in a Native American uh, to say that fur coats are, are part of our indigenous culture and any effort to regulate this is racist against our people. Um, incredibly cynical stuff, but this just kind of shows how much it runs the gamut. Uh, whether you're a big bank or airline or, you know, Sam Bankman free to a fur coat dealer in L.A. who paid off these these young students to testify on your behalf. Yeah, that's why I say, I mean, like Sam, the Sam Bankman fried part of this isn't that he invented it, it's just because of this, the scope of the fraud, it's just going to shed so much light on how it actually works. While I have you, just a couple of uh, quick last questions. The last time you were on my show, as I said, we you were here because we were talking about the work you did on the Twitter files and the story you did about the media, uh, the military rather, deploying fake identities on uh, Twitter, something that uh, we're, we hear only Iran and Russia and China and all the bad countries do. Um, what is the status of your work on the Twitter files? Is it continuing? Do you have other stories coming out? And what do you make of the way in which the media really on day one announced that this was a trivial story, that it was done corruptly, and that most revelations that have emerged and that will continue to emerge have just been declared something that they intend to completely ignore. Um, I have not conducted any recent searches. Um, I had a few days at Twitter HQ in December and one or two days um, uh, after that. But I've, I've done very little new searches, um, but I've, I've got a number of emails that I'm still working on. I'm going to produce uh, more stories based on those documents. Um, on the media's uh, treatment of this reporting, you know, the New York Times covered uh, my story, the CENTCOM story that, that uh -huh. you mentioned, and I, I appeared on your show to discuss. But, you know, I look across the... That was in reverse order of importance. You appeared on my story to discuss, <laughs> and the New York Times covered Well, that, that, that's the duality of yeah, coverage. Exactly. Um, the Glenn Show and New York Times. But, um, you know, just generally, I've, I've, just, I've been disappointed but not surprised. Um, you know, Matt Taibbi's revelations were incredible, just to see the kind of daily and aggressive FBI influence that you know, on issues both weighty and mundane, the FBI was contacting them, you know, every other day, uh, contacting executives at Twitter. Um, to, for the New York Times and other media outlets to ignore that, I think is very strange and, and maybe reflects some type of uh, professional jealousy or something else. It's hard to kind of define their intentions. Um, and, you know, Michael Schellenberger's uh, uh, revelations using the Twitter files 
on how much Jim Baker and, and other Twitter executives were involved in the censorship of uh, the New York Post. The former FBI general counsel who then went to Twitter as the deputy general counsel. Yes, thank you. And, uh, you know, that that's very newsworthy, not just given the uh, role of uh, the Hunter Biden laptop now and the new Congress being investigated, but just the, the role of that, of that whole story and unprecedented nature of the suppression of it in 2020. For the major media outlets to completely ignore this, except for Fox News and maybe a few other conservative outlets, um, you know, I, I find it ridiculous and, you know, again, but not surprising. Yeah, and a testament to why faith and trust in those institutions have all but collapsed across most demographic groups in the United States and why independent media really clear, so clearly is the wave of the future. People just don't trust these outlets any longer. Um, last question. Um, I'm just kind of curious, like, whenever there's a potential to really blow a big, gigantic hole in the way Washington works, like this Sam Bankman Freed investigation does, again, not the part of how he stole money, but the part that he, of how he used it for political influence, it implicates a lot of political figures, implicates a lot of political consultants, people who were just getting money in all sorts of various ways, this incredibly powerful house financial services committee that Maxine Waters has chaired for so many years. I always kind of believe that they're going to find a way to shut it down. I mean, to this day, it is amazing, is it not, that the way in which the Jeffrey Epstein investigation was conducted, he never got to trial because he ended up dying beforehand. And then the way they did the Jose Maxwell trial to make it as narrow as possible, the charges against her and what evidence was admissible. So we saw none of the client list or the potential leverage they might have had is really striking. And there's been no journalistic revelations of this part either. I mean, there's been Julie Brown at the Miami Herald has done great work, but the bulk of it has been remain, has remained hidden. I feel like whenever you have a story like this that, that can really threaten the power centers in Washington, they will find a way to shut it down. What is your expectation about the potential for this investigation going forward to keep revealing things like this document today revealed? Well, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that more of the truth and more revelations come to light. But yeah, you're, you're right that there's a lot of prosecutorial discretion and the direction that uh, the DOJ takes could provide incredible amounts of sunlight to what Sam Bankman-Fried was doing. Or they could take certain plea deals and, and take the investigation in another direction that kind of conceals what was going on. I don't know. I mean, there's been some um, boost in, in terms of just more media, media scrutiny. Um, of course, you know, the, the bankruptcy filings are also interesting, the, the fact that they're going through Chapter 11 and, you know, their company's being um, taken apart. Um, that also provides a little bit more insight into what they were doing. Uh, we had a, a story recently uh, looking at that and how they're paying off just, you know, endless think tanks and consultants and PR firms, a little bit like the indictment today uh, revealed. But again, I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll we're certainly going to keep following that. And uh, I don't know how long you're going to be here, but we'll probably be hectoring you to come back on the show. We have a lot more to talk about. Um, with you, as always, your work is, uh, I think, important and, and always really interesting. So I'm really thrilled that we were able to bring you here into the studio and spend the time talking to you. Thanks for, for being here. It's awesome to be here. The studio looks great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update. Catch our full shows for free live weekdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rumble and join our Locals community at greenwall.locals.com for all of my written journalism, exclusive after-show Q&As, and more.